All right. Um, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, I guess, been two years since the last patient conference. Um, and I didn't really know very much about EB at the previous conference two years ago. And it's really thanks to a lot of you to, for helping really educate me about the disease and how it impacts your lives and how you take care of it. Um, at the last conference, uh, we were just thinking about starting up this company to develop uh, the technology from USC, the technology that Dr. Chen spoke about. And we were originally thinking about developing an intradermal product. It's, as, as Dr. Chen said, that's what dermatologists use most often. And coming to the conference two years ago, it was readily apparent that what bothers and affects patients and families most are the areas that bandages don't reach. And we really should be developing a systemic, a whole body therapy, internal and external. So we really set about trying to look at this in, uh, IV approach, the intravenous therapy approach. And uh, what I'm going to do in my part of the talk is try and tell you about some of the challenges we have to develop the research phase all the way through clinical trial development and to approval, okay? Uh, so it's really about the development of uh, the inventions and, and technology that uh, Dr. Chen spoke about. So we founded Lotus Tissue Repair in 2010, and we spent a lot of time putting together a plan for what the ideal product would be. How do you replace collagen 7 that's deficient or dysfunctional with a protein therapy? And I should tell you that protein replacement therapy is actually a well-established model. There are 80 different products for protein replacement in about 20 different diseases where there's a deficiency in a single gene. So very similar to uh, DEB, where, or dystrophic EB, where you have a deficiency in collagen 7, you can replace that protein by making it recombinantly. Using genetic engineering means, you can make a human protein and then inject that protein directly to replace what's missing or not functional. And there are other, other proteins out there for other diseases, so there's a good model to follow. We have licensed the technology from USC, from Drs. Woodley and Chen. Uh, we've also licensed technology from Drs. Lane and Marinkovich from Stanford uh, to find ways to make this protein and to deliver it and to use it as a therapy. Uh, as you saw, there's uh, a lot of data out there in terms of how can you treat mice with DEB? How can you treat dogs with DEB? And we're very excited by that data. But keep in mind that that's data in animal models of the disease, and we need to make the big leap into how do we treat humans with it. So we've developed a plan where uh, we have a path forward to, to try and uh, dose patients in about a year, and that's the most optimistic scenario. It's dependent on a number of different things that I'll talk about on subsequent slides. Uh, we've assembled a team and we've raised the money to do this work, to actually take the product into the clinic. Um, and I should point out that drug development is really a whole different ballgame. It's very different from basic research. It, it requires special skill sets. And we've uh, engaged a team of physicians and regulatory uh, experts, uh, manufacturing experts, toxicology experts. These are all people who have been involved in the development of protein products for other rare genetic diseases and have taken these products through clinical trials all the way through FDA approval. I should mention that in my last company, we developed a protein product for another rare genetic disease called hereditary angioedema. It took us about 10 years, and uh, we spent a lot of money doing it. Um, but it's a product that's now launched in the US. Uh, it's approved by FDA, and it is really changing patients' lives. And that's, we hope we can do this again, but there's a long road ahead. So this is what we need to overcome. There are several challenges involved with developing this very promising technology. What's the best way to deliver the protein? And very importantly, very important for protein replacement therapies, so how do you actually target that protein? How does it know where to go? And how do you get it there? And how, how do you make it stay there so it's effective? Can we make it? Can, can it be stable and functional? And there are several clinical development questions that I'll come back to but they all relate to awareness. You know, with these very rare genetic diseases, how do you, you really have to educate the FDA. You need to educate the people who will be reviewing our clinical data 
and say, why do you need to approve this quickly in, in, in a way that, uh, you know, what is clinically meaningful? You need to educate them on that. So uh, Dr. Chen talked a lot about the, the delivery, so I'm not gonna really focus much here, other than to say that we kept an open mind. We said, okay, we know in, in animal models that intradermal injections can effectively replace the protein and reverse the disease phenotype, the separation of the epidermis and the dermis was reversed. And that data was published at the time we founded the company. But we said, let's keep an open mind and test topical delivery, let's test intradermal delivery, and, let's, and test intravenous delivery. And we've done all those three. Uh, we've done them in multiple animal models, and we've done them in multiple academic labs. As Dr. Chen said, we've done it at USC, in Germany, and in France. And we've seen very similar results, which is a very encouraging thing to see, and the reproducibility across different sites, uh, and similar effects. With all three modes of delivery, whether it's topical, intradermal, or intravenous, we showed that the collagen 7 actually can get to where it should go. And with intravenous delivery, that was actually a very surprising finding. We would not have predicted that a year ago, that you could give collagen 7 intravenously, it would be, at least have no, no adverse events in the animals, and it could get to the skin, it could get to the esophagus, it could get to the anus. We would not have predicted that. So, so we're very excited to see that in, in the different animal models. As Dr. Chen said, there's a potential to dose collagen 7 once a month or perhaps less often. Uh, we only have data on animals so far. We have limited data on animals so far. And we need to really test this in humans before we can really conclude what the dose will be, what the dosing regimen might be. But it is encouraging because other protein replacement therapies, everybody's familiar with <coughs> insulin and diabetes, or maybe less familiar with factor 8 and hemophilia, Drugs like that are given daily, once a week, once every other week. I think the, the least frequent I know of is uh, once every other week. Uh, so if, if indeed we can dose collagen 7 once a month or once every six weeks, that would really be remarkable. But we need to show that in humans. And the other thing is, uh, researchers have shown that you really only need to replace about 35 to 50% of the collagen 7. And that, that, that's also something that we need to investigate. How much do you actually need to replace to be effective? But with other protein replacement therapies, it's, it's also the case. You don't need 100% replacement. So for a variety of reasons that I outlined here, and Dr. Chen went through these, so I'm not gonna go through them, you, intravenous therapy really offers the ability to treat internal and external lesions, and uh, we have some uh, data that's early but very promising that shows, at least in the mouse models and the dog model, you can deliver it without adverse events. It gets to the skin and these other areas. It gets to unwounded areas. So that has promised that you could maybe prevent the progression of the disease, perhaps. And uh, it, it's actually consistent with other protein therapies. All, all the other protein therapies for rare genetic diseases are given intravenously. So switching gears to manufacturing, um, I, I did a little cartoon here where if you look at at least maybe protein replacement therapies or insulin is really a peptide hormone, but uh, if you look at the, the sizes of these and you say insulin is one, collagen 7 is 173 times larger than insulin. And uh, you know, factor 8, which is the largest protein therapy I know of that's approved for rare genetic disease, is, is 28 times larger than insulin. So this poses a lot of challenges. How do you actually keep this giant protein in solution? How do you actually make it? Can you make enough of it? Um, how soluble is it? It's not very soluble, and it's sticky. So this poses a lot of challenges in terms of how do you fill a vial and keep it genetically stable such that it can be then used in the clinic in the future. Making enough of it is another issue. So, the research at USC has a phenomenal fibroblast cell line. It makes high quality, very pure collagen 7. But the process is, it's unfortunately a, a, an issue with scale. Currently they're made in these plates with an adherent cell, so these cells stick. And you can only harvest about 15 ml or 0.015 liters per plate. 
So it's a very laborious task. You need, it's, it's not possible to scale this up for large clinical trials or for commercial use. It's certainly adequate for early stage clinical trials. So what we did and what, what our collaborators at Stanford have done is shown that you can make this protein is in Chinese hamster ovary cells, which sounds a bit strange, but believe it or not, these are the most commonly used cells for uh, the manufacture of biologic drugs. Um, most of the monoclonal antibodies that are on the market are made in Cho cells. So this provides a very well-trodden path to regulatory approval. And that's really what a lot of the rest of the talk is about, is how do you get a clinical data package together that FDA and other regulatory bodies would find acceptable and, and approvable. And that's really what we need to define. So what we're doing with CHO is we, we've made it in CHO. Uh, we know that we can scale it up, but we're still very early. We're right there. We're at the two liter scale right now. And we just made our first four liter batch. And it takes months to actually get there. But it's pretty obvious from the picture that you know, from going from an adherent cell line, which is pretty laborious, to a cell line that's in suspension, you can actually scale up from a small flask to a 250-liter reactor to next, early next year, we should be at the 1,000-liter scale. But each step has a lot of risk associated with it. And we don't know at what time point will we get there. We hope we'll be there in the first quarter of next year. But this is, we, we'll find out as we, as we move along. Uh, our colleagues at Stanford have developed technology to increase the stability of the collagen 7, so it actually is well folded and will reside longer in the skin, uh, and, and we're currently testing that. So the, the other things that we're thinking about is, okay, what's the path forward? And many of you have said, so you know, when can I, I have a, a, one of my children and have my child in a clinical trial? That really depends. When can we make it? Can we make it on the timeline we think we can? And we have to do a lot of additional animal studies. Uh, this year, we're doing some additional studies in the dog model. We're doing additional studies in the hypomorphic mouse model that Dr. Chen showed. And then we have to do what are called IND-enabling toxicology studies, which are formal studies that FDA requires you to do in two different animal species, where you essentially increase the dose to look at safety and toxicology effects. So that will take us the best part of a year to do that. And in parallel, we'll be doing the manufacturing. The other thing we're doing is uh, to, we're conducting what's called a longitudinal severity study, also called a natural history study, only in the dystrophic form of EB. And we need your help with that. The purpose of this trial really is to define what are the best clinical endpoints. And clinical endpoints you can think of as being uh, outcome measures, measures to look at what is clinically meaningful and that the FDA can say, okay, the drug actually does provide a significant clinical benefit based on whatever it is, an improvement in, in anemia or jumping on the trampoline, as Dr. Wagner showed, if, if that could be quantifiable. So, so the path forward is to do additional animal studies, do the toxicology studies, do, do this longitudinal severity study, and then go into humans with the drug. And we're planning a small trial in dystrophic EB patients. And then depending on what happens there, depending on conversations with the FDA, um, we might be able to go straight into another trial after that. And as you heard from Dr. Chen, USC has got a grant from NIH to conduct a trial with intradermal collagen 7. And that will, can only provide supporting information to help our intravenous development program. So what, what is a clinically me meaningful endpoint? We are very fortunate in the EB field to have the National EB Registry as a resource. There's a lot known uh, about the disease compared to other rare diseases. But from a regulatory standpoint, from a, a long-term follow-up standpoint, there's not as much known. Uh, more could be identified. So that's really the reason we are conducting this longitudinal DEB severity study. There's no drug involved. It's an observational study. And the objectives are really to look at what could be meaningful endpoints over time. And we may, may, may not see any progression over time in what we're measuring, but that's a useful baseline, such that when we come in with the drug, we can look at what is a meaningful change. And this is really to prepare for an eventual regulatory submission to the FDA and other agencies. So, so the, the design of this, it's a one-year-long study. 
They'll have up to 80 patients at uh, three to four clinical sites. And the patients will come in at time zero, six months, and 12 months, have a physical exam, uh, have their extent of blistering quantified, and there'll be some questionnaires to look at quality of life. There's already a validated score called the QOLEB from Dr. Didi Morell in Australia. And there are other EB severity scores. One has been published from Birmingham. There's another one that Dr. Pope is talking about at this conference. Um, there are other instruments for pain, for itching, and for disability. Different endpoints might be, different people here might have different sense of what endpoints are. Some kids might say, oh, I want to see a reduction in itching. That's clinically meaningful to me, or reduction in pain. So the purpose of the study is really to figure out what are the best endpoints to use. So uh, you'll be hearing more about this. It'll actually be a, a formal clinical trial. Um, you know, we, if, if you would like to participate in it, you'll hear about it. You know, we, we've been getting a lot of feedback from a lot of the doctors in the room here uh, who've been very kind to help us develop this. The other way where we can prepare for a regulatory submission is to understand the disease from a patient's perspective. And I'll just give you one example from my prior company where, just to illustrate my point here, um, in the last company where we were working, we, we had a drug approved for hereditary angioedema, we asked physicians and patients the same questions, and we got very different answers. That disease is episodic in nature. These patients have attacks or flares. And when we asked physicians, how many attacks do patients have per year? They said between one and six. And when you ask patients, how many attacks do you have per year? They said between 23 and 29. And that's a big difference. And you say, well, you know, wh why is that different? And it's actually quite simple. The patients only see their physician when the attack was life-threatening in nature, it required hospitalization, it required surgery, it required prescription pain medications. On the other hand, there was no treatment available until recently. So patients said, you know, I'll just take my pain medications and tough it out at home. And that was actually the reason for the difference we saw. Uh, so it, it really gave me a sense of the value of patient-reported information. It's obviously only as good as what's inputted into the database, but it's critical to uh, educate us from a clinical development point of view, educate other researchers on other forms of EB that we're not working on, and eventually to really educate the regulators. It provides uh, information that also just helps the whole community. Prevalence, it's actually not really clear what is the prevalence of the different types. How many patients are there with recessive dystrophic versus dominant dystrophic and others? The severity of the disease is very variable from patient to patient. Your experience really matters. What is the cost of current care? And the, the other purpose of this registry is it provides data that helps identify patients for clinical trials and eventually we hope will, will help uh, with reimbursement. It helps Deborah with that, its advocacy efforts. Uh, I recently uh, published a paper on why registries are important and um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's critical for any rare disease to have a registry like this, to really get that information from a patient's perspective. Um, so we launched uh, a, a registry, we, we actually funded a re this registry called EB Care uh, with Deborah International and Deborah of America. And I can understand that some of you might say, oh, you know, I don't want my data out there. And um, this registry is compliant with HIPAA and other privacy laws. Ne never will your name be associated with the data Researchers who wish to access the data have access to it. Um, all the data that will be provided will be anonymous. But this is the kind of data that's collected. So wh while you, you do talk about your name, age, and position, that data is only managed by the curator. And the curator is a company called Inolist, or Patient Crossroads. Uh, they've built 200 disease registries. Um, so they've, they've done this a, a fair bit. They also have a grant from the Office of Rare Disease Research to build additional registries, uh, and they house this registry. It's a secure server and it has a lot of protections in place. My interest is really, oops, is, is really on the um, pharmacogenomic side and to some extent on the severity of disease and uh, current standards of care. Uh, things like missed school and work days, for example, are very useful information to tell FDA. It's an obvious 
measure of quality of life. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, this is a website, you know, you can create an account, it takes only a few minutes to create an account, but the survey is long, it's 120 questions. But it provides invaluable data, we have about 250 patients in it right now, about half of them have completed the whole survey, so thank you for those who participated and being patient with it. Um, the registry was built based on a survey we did here, actually, in Cincinnati two years ago. Um, some of you probably participated in that and wondered what, what happened with that old-fashioned survey we handed out. It was a paper survey that people filled out in pen and ink. Um, and we had an amazing response there. We had, I think, uh, 56 patients who finished this, or parents who finished the survey. 30 of them were diagnosed RDB patients. And we just uh, actually analyzed a lot of the data. It's probably obvious to you, but it's not obvious to us, it's not obvious to FDA, it's not obvious to insurance companies that how time-consuming bandaging is, how long it takes to bathe and bandage your child, um, what the costs might be. You know, and uh, talking about pain and uh, missed school days, this is all data that didn't exist. A lot of it is not in the, new, the National EB Registry. So this is the kind of data we want to capture from the EB Care Registry, which is a, a, a more sophisticated version of this survey we did. But this data is good enough that we, we're actually having a company called Medco translate this into costs. And we, we hope to publish that study um, this year. So I'll skip over that one and just uh, summarize by saying that we founded this company solely to work on dystrophic EB and develop the technology from USC and Stanford uh, as protein replacement therapy in EB. Uh, we've got some promising early data. Uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, but we have a clear path to do so, and there's a lot of risks that we need to overcome. There are lots of challenges I've talked about, and uh, you know, we'll keep you posted. Uh, you can help, you can participate in the longitudinal severity study, you can participate in the patient registry. Uh, this really would not have been possible with, without a lot of feedback from all of you and your doctors and caregivers. Uh, certainly not possible without the USC uh, inventors of the technology. Uh, likewise with our collaborators at Stanford and Freiburg in, in France. Um, the registry was a really a, a close collaboration with Deborah of America and Deborah International. Uh, John Dart's here from Deborah International. Um, our clinical advisory boards here, um, and we've had several additional advisors as well who have really contributed on their own time to the design of the, the longitudinal severity study and uh, to comment on the preclinical data. Uh, finally, uh, uh, thank my colleagues at Lotus. I wanted to just introduce them, if I can see them. Uh, Jim Fordyce and F Dr. Riley were my co-founders with uh, Dr. Zubili and Chen. Uh, Dr. Riley is right there, and uh, Jim Fordyce is there. Um, Hal Landy, uh, Dr. Landy is a, a pediatric endocrinologist who's helping us with the longitudinal severity study and clinical development. He's back there. Um, he's been, he and uh, Deb Ramsdell, who's right next to him, uh, have both been involved with other protein replacement therapies uh, that have been taken all the way through clinical trials and approval. Um, and my colleagues Jennifer Gorsolini and James Scheffler, who are there, uh, are helping us out with the EB registry. So if you have questions, you can talk to one of us, uh, or you can email me or call. Thanks. One thing I'm curious about is um, my son is going to be 21 and he has a recessive dystrophic EB. And in your trials, you, you induce the EB in the animals, and so they really had the short-term short -term effects, overall body effects of EB. So with my son, he's got the, the anemia, he's got, well he also has IgA nephropathy and a few other things. So what I'm curious about is with these uh, the intravenous approach with the proteins, do you have to have, do you have to be healthy otherwise? Yeah, so, so first of all, on the animal models, um, they're, they're actually spontaneous models. So the, the, the one that, you, the dog model is a spontaneous model. Uh, there are, the, the other models were, like the grafting model is actually a contrived model. It came from a knockout mouse that was created. But the dog model is actually a spontaneous model. It, it naturally occurred in dogs and while the hair of the dogs physically anchors the epidermis to the dermis, it was hard to see with the light, but they had a lot of oral lesions and right. esophageal lesions, they get strictures. Um, so so th that is representative of the disease. 
Um, in terms of age, you know, we, our first trials are going to be actually in adults. FDA usually requires that. And we're, you know, we, we don't know what the, the effect is going to be, but we're going to treat adults with RDEB in, in our trials. So we, we just have to see, um, see, see what develops. So, because I was going to say with mindset, we do monthly transfusions for the anemia, so of course we develop antibodies, and yeah, and his bodies just take a lot of wear and tear, and so I would say maybe possibly chemically, biologically, it's not, it's, I don't know what the right word is, it's not in perfect condition. And so would that make a difference in the effectiveness of this, or could there be a potential interaction of this, because he, yeah. his body is chemically out of balance. How do you, perhaps you want to comment on, on that? Sure. I, you know, in, in most of the um, protein replacement therapies that have been developed, these are severe, in many cases, life-threatening disorders. Uh, the patients are, um, or some of the patients uh, are near death. Um, and so those are exactly the kinds of patients that we have treated. And many of these um, therapies have um, been approved by regulatory authorities all over the world. So uh, the, the sorts of things that you're describing in your, in your son would be exactly the kinds of things that we would uh, look at and, and hope to actually have an impact on. Thank you. Thanks. I wish we had time for, for more uh, questions. Thank you, Dr.